Well, hello, friends. I'm Bishop Brandon Porter. Thank you for tuning in to our weekly repost. I want to appreciate you and yours for doing so, and I pray the Word of God is going to bless you in a special way. It's entitled, A Timely Prayer. Talking about Nehemiah and how he had to pray quick, fast, and in a hurry because God was about to do something astronomical for he and for the children of Israel. Be blessed by it. Um, Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, perhaps through verse 4. When you get it, shout amen. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of uh, Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had been before time sad, in, not been sad before in his presence. Verse 2, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad? seeing thou art not sick. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Verse 3, And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulcher, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Talk Nehemiah. Verse 4, then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Father, I give you thanks and pray cause increase and see this truth and touch by it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to talk for a few moments about a timely prayer. Take your seats if you would. A timely prayer. Help me say that. A timely prayer. How many know that prayer is essential in this season and time of our lives? Amen. It is something that uh, we are privileged to be able to do. It is not um, um, something that we should take for granted. It is a privilege to come into the presence of God and to have conversation and communion with him uh, about our lives and our situations and circumstances and etc. Nehemiah has a love and devotion for his home and foundation, as we'll see in our text. This is Nehemiah talking to the king of Persia at this time, and uh, you'll see the job description and all that his responsibilities were. But he had a love and devotion for his home, being a Jew himself, and foundation, and never forgot what God had put in him. And that's something that is important for us to understand, that we should never forget what God puts in us. Say that I must never forget what God put in me. Sometimes we're overcome with where God put us in instead of what God put in us. But you have to be mindful of what he put in you, amen? Greater is he that is what? In us than he that is what? In the world, according to 1 John 4 and 4. So uh, Artaxerxes... Um, the first ruled from B.C. 40, 465 to 423. Roughly about 42 years was his reign uh, there in Persia. And during the time of Nehemiah was this time uh, where he's engaging with him was roughly about 20 years into uh, his administration. So this event roughly occurred if he started his um, rule in Persia in B.C. 465. This had to be then uh, 445 B.C., okay, 20 years beyond. Jerusalem was under tyranny or oppression of Persia. And many times Jerusalem had been held captive, and sometimes because of their waywardness and inability to maintain their consistency with God. Sometimes God allows other things that happen in our worlds to bring us closer to him or to make us understand how good we had it before. So Jerusalem was now under, under tyranny or oppression by, of Persia, and the city was left pretty much in, in ruins. The gates were consumed. You heard that in um, Nehemiah's conversation to the king. The gates were consumed by fire. The walls were torn down, and the people were suffering and starving. Those that the remnant that was left behind there uh, in Jerusalem, even the graves and their of their ancestors were 
in disrepair. And so there was great havoc and, and problems in Jerusalem. But Nehemiah had a, a job. You know, it's important no matter where you are positioned in life, uh, you have to learn how to rise to the occasion and maintain a sense of excellence and essentialness. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. Help me say that, the king's cupbearer which means he was highly trusted because to be a cupbearer means that uh, you had to be trusted because you were pouring the king's drinks and you had to taste the drink before he tasted it, he and his guest, uh, because the kings had many enemies at these times and so they were always uh, worried about uh, their lives and someone trying to take them out simply to take their places. So you had to be trustworthy. Some people want to be trusted before they are trustworthy. Amen? How many understand that? So trust is something that has to be earned and discerned. Say that trust is something that has to be earned and discerned. So again, most kings were afraid for their lives, and so they needed trustworthy persons to be their cupbearer. So the cupbearer would taste his wine before he or his guest, again, would drink it. He had to, to look presentable. He had to be clean. Uh, he had to be graceful in his presentation. Even when he held the king's cup, he had to hold it with his fingertips, okay? He didn't grab the top of the king's, no. He had to hold it with his fingertips like so, okay? This was to reflect that this is not mine. It belongs to someone else. You know, you be careful, folk, to grab something and here, here. No, no, that's not a cupbearer. <laughs> you can't take ownership of it when it doesn't belong to you. So it was a sense of respect in how he handled what belonged to the king. Amen? It also displayed humility. Not everybody can serve the king. I can't get no witnesses up in here. Not everybody can even serve the pastor. Not calling myself a king, unless I'm talking about king fish or somebody, but, but, uh, but not everybody can serve the leader because they don't know how to humble themselves and uh, they get pre-exposed to things and don't know how to handle them. Old folks say you got to see and don't see. You got to hear and don't hear. Some of y'all talk too much to be close to the leader. Y'all don't like me up in here. Just help me help somebody out. Turn to somebody and say, hush, hush. hush, hush. <laughs> so uh, even this, watch this. He had to wash the king's cup in his presence. Sound like they had corona, didn't it? He had to wash the king's cup in the presence of the king, okay? See, if the king could not trust you, then no one else could trust you. So kind of somewhat like God. If God can't trust you, nobody else can. So I tell you all, don't be marrying these fellas that don't pay tithe because if God can't trust them, you'll never get your hair fixed after you marry them. You ain't going to be able to trust them to bring the check home. Your nails going to be long as birds because you ain't going to be able to go nowhere and get nothing done. Amen. You're going to start losing weight. He ain't going to buy no food for the house. Just a thief and a robber. Amen, somebody. So if the king can trust you, no one else could. You understand? The same again is true with God. Your loyalty, this is something I want you to grasp. Your loyalty is subject to your character. Do y'all be listening to me when I'm preaching? All right. Your loyalty, I try to tell you something, I really do. Your loyalty is subject to your character. Let me help you know something about people. So in many cases, as noted in the scripture, these lords and rulers would take note of the loyalty, watch this, of these slaves and servants that they had towards their God. And sometimes that's what was most impressive because these were exiled persons. Uh, Nehemiah was from Jerusalem, so he was a captive. He was a slave. But because of his devotion, just like Daniel and some of the others, the, the uh, Hebrew boys and so on, and their willingness to die for their conviction. And so sometimes people in the secular 
have more respect for you when they notice how much respect you have for your God. Oh, yes, Lord. When you go to the, the party that they have on the job and everybody's drinking and you say, no, I'm sorry, I don't drink. Just give me some sparkling water or something. I'll be fine. It, it doesn't mean that now you are on the out. No, no, no. They look at you. They're respecting you now because you have some principles. Amen, somebody, right? When every man around the office know he can't get you into the hotel. Come on, talk to me. You got to hold on to something. People respect values and loyalties that we have, especially when it comes to our God. That's why some of y'all will never get off work on Sunday because they know you ain't saved. Come on, I, I, I want to be off on Sunday so I can go to church. They tell you, the way you cuss around here ain't no way in the world you going to church. They're taking note of the way you live. So your loyalty is subject to your character. Say that my loyalty is subject to my character. Amen. And so uh, it's determined by the degree of your faithfulness. So loyalty and commitment are recyclable after conversion. I'm going to make sense in a minute. Okay. You can recycle a person's loyalty and commitment after conversion. What does recycle mean? You can reuse it. Amen. You can use it in a sense of another way, right? So if you are loyal and committed after you get saved, we can still use that same nature or character of yours. Because if you were, if you were loyal there, you'll be loyal here. Amen. Some of our practices don't have to change in righteousness because it's more so about why than the what you did. That's why God judges our hearts, amen, more than he judges our actions, amen, somebody. See, sometimes we know the what, but you don't know the why. Say amen. And I know God does not smile on divorce, but you don't know why everybody got divorced. Hello? And you let somebody keep beating you upside your head and, and coming in the house talking about, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. And then you see how long you stay there. You don't know everybody's situation. Come on, talk to me. So before we start judging people about what, I'll never, you say, I'll never all you want to until somebody asks you to. Then you'll say what you won't do. Some of y'all never been to the casino because you ain't had no gas in the car. I'll never. You don't know what you do till you get asked. Is that right, somebody? So if you were faithful, watch this, and loyal to the world. Anybody remember when you were in the world? If you were faithful and loyal in the world, you should be faithful and loyal to the word now. So if you were a soldier in the game, you ought to be a soldier now for the Lord. Come on, talk to me now. How you going to wear the colors of the crypts and the blood and then when we tell you to wear gray, you don't want to do it. You come over here now, you want independence. But you've been a gang member all this. You, you did everything they told you to do out there. You were, you were uh, in your sorority. Yeah, I'm pointing at my daughter over there. Your sorority or your fraternity. You did everything. Yeah, yeah, everything they told you to do. All we do is ask you to lift your hand and tell them thank you. Like, Amen, somebody, right? Amen. So, so when I gave my life to Christ, you know, uh, I, I liked to dance before I got saved. You know, I, 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 was, I, I created the dance called the Funky Chicken. That was me. I know they said Rufus Thomas, but he got it from me. Amen. Um, he did. And so I could dance. I don't know what y'all looking at me like. Oh, I could throw down, dog. I could throw down. So when I got saved, check it out. I didn't stop dancing. I just changed partners. Amen. Before I got saved, I liked to talk. As you can tell, I still like to talk. I just changed my conversation. Somebody say amen up in here. So when you give your life to Christ, whatever you used to do, you ought to do better now for him. Is that right, somebody? If you were a giver then, you ought to be a giver now. Say amen, church. Is that right? So the cupbearer had to always bring, watch this, positive energy to the king. 
positive energy. The king and the leaders can't have people around them that drain them. The cupbearer had to bring positive energy to the king. Why? Because usually when he was around, the king was eating. And you don't want to be frustrated while you're eating. Whenever, take this as a note. Whenever you're eating, and wives, help your husbands. Whenever you're eating, you need a good atmosphere. If you ever eaten and you're upset, you're going to have indigestion and problem, digested, all kind of problems there in your intestinal system because, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. You need to be calm and at a peaceful state when you, you can't be eating. I told you, leave me alone, Lily. I have to shop me. Huh? You try, you're going to choke to death. So you, you, have to, you have to have a peaceful atmosphere. So the cupbearer, one of his jobs or responsibilities was to bring some some peace, some laughter, or some enjoyment to the king. Are you with me? And many times he was around uh, the king's families, right? He was around the king's family. And so um, in this particular time in our um, text, uh, when he's coming to the king, uh, it was really about four months Later, the, the, the opening text said the, the Nissan, it was in the year Nissan, with Nissan meant April, uh, because he was trying to come to him in December, and he ended up going to him roughly four months later, which is uh, Nissan is April. And so, and he had spent many times, of course, many days and, and times because of his involvement with the family, with being a cupbearer and a servant to the king, he was around the wife and so on. But at this particular time, uh, God knows what you need. Amen? Amen. Help me say, God will set it up sometimes. You got to understand something, because this queen in particular, who some theologian says was uh, Esther, who herself was a Jew. So she was passionate and concerned about the request of Nehemiah to go back and to rebuild the city and the walls of Jerusalem, right? So the wife is important in many of the husband's dealings. Can I give a little lesson right quick? The wife is important in many of the husband's dealings. That's why she must be wise. A wise woman does what? Builds up her home, but what happens? A foolish one does what? Plucks it down brick by brick. <laughs> Amen, somebody. So a wife must be wise, especially if now you're being allowed to be into some of these settings that would not normally be the case. Wives, remember, you will have input if you stay put, you will have, did y'all catch that? I didn't see nobody quicken. You will have input if you stay put. But if you leave your place, if you don't stay put, then you can't have input. Amen, somebody. So because she was there, because she was there when Nehemiah brought the concern, she was able to add and lend to the request of Nehemiah. You better get to know the wife. Look at somebody say, get to know the wife. <laughs> Amen. Some places I've been invited to preach was not because the pastor wanted me, the wife wanted me. Why don't you call Bishop Porter? <laughs> you know, the wife, that's called what? Pillow talk. Amen. She can get through to the leader. Amen. So ironically, again, this particular queen um, suggested that she was perhaps Esther and therefore she had a genuine concern for what Nehemiah's concern was as well. So notice, a few things happen as I talk about timely prayer. Because in the text, it does not disclose his prayer. I was really wanting uh, there to be a, a description and totality of his prayer. But it just mentions that he prayed. All right? So a few things I want to pull out right quick. The site of the prayer. Where was this prayer? He's standing in the palace. He's serving the king. He has this sadness on his face, and he was concerned because, remember in the text, it says that uh, he was afraid for his life because the king says, okay, what's going on with you? You, you don't look right. You're kind of sad acting. He says, and this is sorrowness of heart. You're not sick. 
And so the first thing Nehemiah says, remember, because the king is concerned about his life, if somebody come bringing him something and they're acting funny, he's going to think they're going to poison me. So the first thing Nehemiah says, oh, king, live forever. In other words, king, my sadness is not about you. Okay? I, I want no harm to, to come to you. So he's trying to look out for his own life when he says this, oh, king, live forever. But he goes on to talk about, he says, why shouldn't I be sad when my home is in disrepair? The, the, uh, the gates of, of the city I'm from are on fire and the graves are disturbed of my ancestors and the people are starving back in my homeland. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm in this way I am in sadness and frustration. And so the king asks, what do you want? As soon as the king asked him, what did he want? Notice what he did. He prayed. That's what the Bible says. He prayed. Where was this prayer? In the palace. Prayer is not limited to a location. And especially when you're praying instantly as one needs to. You can pray in your car, beloveds. Tell them, I'm just trying to get to church so I can pray. You can pray in the car. Pull over. Amen, somebody. Have prayer right there. I can't tell you how many times I had to pray right in the car until my windows fogged up. You got to pray whenever you can. Amen, somebody. Right? So my dad used to often say, and I could hear him saying it over and over when we had our live radio broadcast on WDIA many, many moons ago. He says, a sincere desire of the heart is a prayer to God. Amen? So man should what? Always pray. So that's the first thing. The sight of the prayer was in the palace right then and there. You got to be able to pray Johnny on the spot. Amen? You shouldn't have to sing a hymn before you can pray. Amen. No, 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 no. Just go on and pray right there. The speed of the prayer, the sight of the prayer, number two, the speed of the prayer, right? We need God on speed dial. Say that we need God on speed dial. Only so many favorites are allowed when you have, you know, speed dialing, favorites. There are only so many they allow because if you add someone else, it'll knock some others out, right? So it's a select group, and God should always be in your select group, amen. Somebody you want to reach real quick, fast, and in a hurry, is that right? Not everybody deserves to be on speed dial. Every now and then, I got to go back and delete some people that are no longer essential for my speed dial. Amen, somebody. So what's the benefit of having someone on speed dial? It's because you talk to them often. And our relationship with God, beloveds, don't get to the place where you don't talk to God. In all thy ways, what? Acknowledge him and what will he do? Direct your path, right? And so he was able to jump right there in prayer immediately, right at the drop of the hat, the, the king asked, what do you want? He had time before answering the king to pray. So he prayed right away, amen? And then there was not just the sight of the prayer, the speed of the prayer, but the silence of the prayer. He did not pray out loud. Everybody don't need to know what you're asking God for. Say that everyone doesn't need to know what I'm asking God for. Some things are between me and God. Can I get a witness up in here? Amen. Who are you talking to anyways? I was, you know, I was praying one time and somebody said, I can't hear you. I said, I ain't talking to you. I know you in here with me, but I ain't talking to you. I'm, you know, if I want to say grace, Bishop, will you say grace? But I said, oh, we can't hear you. I ain't talking to you. Just hope I can get through to him. Amen, somebody, right? So who are you talking to anyway? You're talking to God, right? Hannah, remember when Hannah was praying and asking God for a male child? The Bible says that she was at the wall and she was praying and she was just mumbling. And the king heard her mumbling. He couldn't understand what she was saying. And he thought she was intoxicated. Or the priest, should I say, thought she was intoxicated. And because her prayer was not to him, it was to God. You got to understand that God knows your heart. So even when it's moans and groans and you can't get the words out, sometimes you're so heavy, beloveds, you can't even get the words out. You can't even explain what you're saying, but God can interpret your heart. Somebody help me say hallelujah. hallelujah. The devil don't understand what you're talking about, but God said, I got you. Oh, Lord. And God said, I got you. Amen. <clears throat> so then... The fourth part is the shortness of the prayer. Yeah. See, he had an established relationship with God. And that's why some of y'all got to pray so long is because you don't know God. You, you got to spend most of your time saying, uh, this, is, uh, this is me, Robert. Uh, I live on uh, 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 Jackson Street, and uh, my mama's name is Mabel Ann. 
And my daddy's name is Billy Bob. And you got to try to explain because you don't know that God already knows you. But because you don't have a relationship with God, you're talking all around the corner instead of going right to what you want, right? When you have a relationship with somebody, you just come and tell them, hey, I need $5. I know that's right. right? You don't got to tell them nothing. That's, I need $5. Yeah. And because of the relationship, they say, okay, well, that's all you need. That's all you need. Yeah. Amen, right? You can move like that because you have what? Relationship. And remember something that he had already, he planned to talk to the king in December, but didn't get to talk to him until April. Sometimes you got to know you can't rush it. Look at somebody and say, you can't rush it now. You got to move in the time of God. Because God knows best when you need what to happen. Say amen, somebody. So he had already been meditating and consecrating. He had already been prepared for this season and time to make a presentation before the king so he was already ready. He knew what he needed from God and he could get straight to the point. Is that right, somebody? How many know sometimes your prayer is just simply this? Help me, Lord. Matter of fact, it can get shorter than that and your prayer can simply be this. Jesus! Anybody ever been there where you just had to call on the name of the Lord and let him make a way out of no way? Hallelujah! Somebody shout his name, Jesus. Come on. That's right. You don't have to pray all day. Just get through. A sincere desire of the heart is a prayer to God. It's not a multiplicity of words. It's a sincere desire of the heart to God. Is that right, somebody? All right. And then fifthly and finally, the subject of the prayer. Okay. Not just the shortness now, but the subject, which was grant me favor to do your work. The gates, the walls, the, the place to live that I need as well. Grant me permission and authority. And he gave him a leave and a letter. So Nehemiah was concerned that the Lord's name was, being, uh, was not being esteemed uh, as it should have been because the city of Jerusalem was in ruins. And Jerusalem would be a testimony to the greatness of Almighty God. Amen, somebody. The people had, that had returned had no way of defending themselves, and Nehemiah was uh, ultimately the governor, okay? Ezra was the priest, but Nehemiah was the governor. So he was concerned about the municipalities and the other matters of the area, whereas Ezra, who was the uh, priest at the time, was concerned more so about the spirituality of the people. You need some people that know how to have, handle business in ministry as well. Say amen, somebody. We don't just need everybody praying. We need somebody to know how to handle contracts and, and situations. And that's where his expert, expertise was coming in. So as a result of Nehemiah's desire to undertake the um, formidable task of reestablishing civil authority in Jerusalem, uh, he let nothing distract him from his goal in making Jerusalem a strategic center of refuge again for the remnant of the Israelites that lived in the region. He wanted to make sure that he was able to build the walls up again so the city could be secured, right? Amen, somebody. So Nehemiah, again, was appointed governor by, uh, of, Ju of Judea uh, by the Persian emperor, and soon afterward, uh, he came to Jerusalem. In addition, he was given military escort and governmental funding uh, from uh, Art Exerceres to aid him in repairing the city. So he got favor from the king. Amen, somebody. Amen. Help me say righteous people righteous. need to have favor. You got to know who's who, even in your city. Amen, somebody. There's an old story about Bishop Mason who went to visit one of the preachers in town, right? And so before the preacher wanted to take Bishop Mason to his church, he said, well, no, my boy, before we go to your church, my boy, let's just walk around downtown, my boy. And so he said, yes, sir, Bishop. So Bishop Mason, you know, Bishop Mason said all these churches of all over the country, the world. And so he's walking around this town with this pastor. And they walk, because uh, Bishop liked to walk. They walked for about an hour or so downtown. And they finally got to the man's church. And the man said, Bishop, this is my church here. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to pastor here. He says, well, my boy, I'm sorry to tell you, my boy, but I've got to move you. He said, what you mean, Bishop? I just got here. I said, but you've been here, sir, about a, about a year or so, my boy. He said, yeah, but Bishop, I got so much I want to do. I want you to see what I'm about to do. He says, my boy, I've walked with you downtown for an hour, and nobody spoke to you. So in other words, 
nobody knows you in this town, my boy, so I got to move you. You, know, you got to be effective in your city. Look at your neighbor and say, my community needs to know who I am. Oh, yes, Lord. Amen. You got to have a name in your city. Say amen, somebody. Now, I don't, I'm not saying this for grandiose flatter. I'm just telling you the truth. Can I touch you with the truth? Anywhere you go in this town, you say Brandon Point. Oh, I know him. I know. Y'all act like that's what's up? Really? You know you do. Some of y'all be trying to get favors on your job. My pastor, Bishop Porter. Amen. <laughs> but that's because the leader ought to be able to lead his community. Let me tell you something. I'm, my friend, I got pastor friends all over this town, all over this city. But I must say this. I pastor Memphis. Right. Amen, somebody. I be the pastor of the big M. Amen, somebody. <laughs> Praise God. Because I love people and, and I understand. My dad was, he said, I'm the good shepherd of North Memphis. I just went on, took it a little further, said, I'm the good shepherd of Memphis. Amen, somebody. So, with God's help, he planned and supervised the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. You got to have people with understanding of how life works. Amen, somebody. And in the church, sometimes that's where we falter because we put people in charge of stuff they have no skills in, no profession in, just because they're faithful. Everybody faithful doesn't mean they're good at it. Just because you showed up don't mean you know how to paint. Right? Sometimes you got to pull on people's strengths. Are y'all hearing me talk to you? All right? So this book beautifully demonstrates the fact that the Lord will sometimes use men who do not acknowledge him as the one and true living God. That's why you got to have relationships outside of the walls of the church. You got to understand God will give you favor with people of, of other walks of life just so you can be able to administer what you need for the kingdom, right? Your boss may not believe in God, but he still may give you a donation for your church because of you. Because he or she believes in you. Amen, somebody. So even in this world in existence, we know, and as, as priests and as men and women of God, we have to insist on certain values that we hold true to, to, to be principles in our land. But understand something, your politician is not a pastor. You got to be the pastor. Amen, somebody. We have to be the ones. And I'm going to pull on whatever politician I can to get the needs of our community met. Say amen, somebody. Amen, amen right? They may be doing what they do, but I don't have to do what you do. I may show up at the mayor's birthday party, and I have shown up for all kinds of celebrations, and they were drinking and doing what they do, but I didn't drink. I lifted up a standard. Amen, somebody. I was walking around because I know they're going to need me after a while. Yeah. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Help me say the people of God are important. Of God are important. I remember I was in the hospital once and um, I was going to visit somebody and I got on the elevator. You know, I told you I like to talk. And so I got on the elevator and uh, a nice looking lady got on and she had a badge or someone. I said, uh, are you a physician? She says, well, I am a specialist. She says, I'm the one they call on when the doctor doesn't know what to do. And so I had my, I was suited and booted too. She says, and uh, what are you? I said, well, I'm the one they call on when you don't know what to do. <laughs> but just to show you, show you how out of touch she was, the first thing she said, so you an undertaker? I said, no, no, no. I'm a preacher. <laughs> Amen. Are you an undertaker? I started to push her off that elevator. Amen. <laughs> So, Nehemiah served under a heathen king, right? But God touched the king's heart and gave him allowance to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, amen, somebody, and to do what was necessary for the family of God. Let me tell you something, beloved, you got to understand something. This whole act of being a cupbearer, don't confuse the cup with the cause, Tell somebody, don't confuse the cup with the cause. Because Nehemiah, though he was the cupbearer, sometimes you got to do what you got to do until you can do what you want to do. Amen. Amen, somebody. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't be talking about, I, I ain't nobody's cupbearer. I ain't nobody's servant. No, you got to do what you got to do sometimes until you can do what you want to do. You may have to cook those french fries until you become the manager. Somebody say amen. 
You got to learn your way up. Somebody say, learn your way up. You got to figure out how to advance in life as you go up. Thank God. I'm so glad for my experience in the church because I didn't go up the escalator. I went up the stairs. Turn to somebody and say, every now and then you got to go up the stairs. Come on, tell them you got to get your workout in. You got to climb those stairs. I know y'all trying to get to the top quick, but every now and then you got to work at the bottom so you can appreciate being at the top. Somebody shout hallelujah. So don't confuse the cup with the cause. Even though he was a cup bearer, he didn't mind having to wash the king's cup and have to drink before everybody else drank something just to make sure that it wasn't poisonous. Amen, somebody. Every now and then, you got to be the first partaker. You've got to be the sacrificial lamb. That's why when it comes to the kingdom of God and what we do here in the church, I'm out there on the parking lot too. I'm giving out food as well. Amen, somebody. I'm helping others here and there because it's important not just to try to be at the top, but understand what it means to bear the cup. And when I think about the cup bearer, it just came to me as I was studying this passage. I thought about another principal cup bearer, and that was Jesus Christ. The Bible said that he prayed and said, Father, remove this cup from me. Let it pass from me. Why is that? Because of the devastation in the cup. Because of the demoralization in the cup. Because of death being in the cup. He saw the suffering and pain of the cup. But he decided, I'll drink the cup before they drink it. Amen. I'll be wounded for their transgressions. I'll be bruised for their iniquities. Come on and say hallelujah in here. So Jesus had to drink from the cup. Thank God he drank from the cup. Somebody say, thank God for Jesus being my cup bearer. Now, why did Jesus drink from the cup? It's because he understood the cause. Remember, don't confuse the cup with the cause. He looked at the cup and he said, but it's not greater than the cause. There's suffering in here. There's pain. There's agony. There's excruciating situations in here. But he says, I can't confuse this with the cause. Because the cause is that men and women might be saved. Amen. That whosoever will can come to God just as they are without one plea. And be delivered from their sins and their situations. Turn to somebody and say, whatever you're going through now. God is just one prayer way. And don't you ever forget you can call on the name of almighty God and somebody help me say he will make a way somehow come on and give him praise and glory come on and give him praise and glory hallelujah he will make a way a way somehow come on give him thanks somebody praise the Lord our God hallelujah hallelujah a timely prayer because he's a timely God. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share and declare. And I pray that something has been said that pushes us towards promise. That we might be what you desire of us to be. In the name of the Lord. Everyone stand quickly if you would with me. Clap your hands in his presence, somebody. Yes, Jesus was a cup bearer too. Isn't that wonderful revelation? Yes, he was. In the name of the Lord. <clears throat> thank you. Amen. As I push towards our conclusion on today I want you to know that whatever you might need is one prayer away he's an on-time God but we have to understand that we have to come to him in time we have not the Bible says because we what ask not you know why I believe he wants us to come to him in prayer is because he wants us to know without equivocation that he's the answer to our needs and whenever you acknowledge or you come to God, you're signaturally saying, God, you're the one that can do this. Amen? When someone approaches you for help, it's because they apparently believe you could do it. And when you go to God for assistance, for help, for guidance, for direction, for intervention, you're saying by faith, Father, I know no other help I know. You're the one that can do this. Amen? Come on, say, God, I come to you. For whatever your situations are, whatever your difficulties are, I want to challenge you to believe God in the midst of this storm and this situation. Saints, it's time to pray. This is a time to pray, a time to pray. It's time to pray now to intercede, to go after God. Just as Nehemiah 
you may not have a, have to have a bunch of words just immediately God what I need I need right now I need it in the nitty-gritty and God can answer that prayer immediately he's a quick God amen somebody the Word of God is quick and powerful but so is God's response he will respond to his word can I get a witness in here and meet your need right now father in Jesus name I thank you for these forgive us of our sins that we might stand before you in clear reception to receive from your promise touch these right now if there be any sick amongst us I pray you heal their bodies in the name of Jesus even those that are quarantined God I pray that you give them speedy recovery and God even those others that may not have been exposed yet cover and shield them I pray in the name of Jesus thank you for the healing virtue thank you God for those who were challenged even this weekend and how you turn things around for them we've heard some good reports of your miracle powers thank you for being a saving delivering God you've never failed us and we know you never will in Jesus name amen and amen clap your hands again in his presence hallelujah we're going to we're going to give we're going to sow we're going to give amen it's time to give you supposed to clap your hands right thank you Thank you. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. As we prepare our, as we prepare our seed, as we prepare to sow and to give and to be a blessing, I want to challenge you, amen, that we would be a blessing to the work of the kingdom of the Lord. Amen. amen. God is able and he's willing and ready right now. I want to challenge you to sow. Those of you that are watching online, thank you for your dedication and your support to this ministry. Uh, for these months, so many of you have been faithful in supporting and giving your tithe and your offering. I want to thank you for that. I want you to know that we don't take it for granted because we need your support to continue to do that, all that we do. And I want to thank you for your loving support to the work of the Lord. And may God continue to add to you as you continue to add to the ministry. I was talking to uh, Deacon uh, Tony Payne. He was telling me how he picks up his dad and brings him over to the house and the family gets around and watches. He said, we hadn't missed one Sunday, Bishop, where they watch around the screen every Sunday. Thank you all for that. And others of you, other families of you, the Naps and others, I can't call everybody's name. I wish I had a list. I'd call all your names right now. But I want to thank you for your dedication, for your love and your support to the work of the Lord. I know it's a difficult season for so many of us. Amen. Uh, but God's going to see us through. Anybody believe that? He's going to see us through. Amen. He's going to see us through. I believe God's got an answer for this pandemic. He knows what he's going to do. Amen. And whether it be vaccine or, or something else, he knows what he's going to do. Amen. Because some of y'all are afraid of the vaccine as well. <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all don't get the, the uh, what do you call it, the, thing, the, the flu shot as it is, right? And so, but however, whatever God's going to do, I'm believing that God's going to give us a breakthrough in this situation. I'm praying for you and your family as well. Thank you, GCT family. Those of you that are here with us, we're going to sow seed. There's so many ways you can give. Hopefully it'll be on your screen there. That is Cash App, that is Givelify, that is PayPal. There's so many opportunities of giving. You can even bring it by the church. Amen. And give it here or you can call the church 901-542-5255 and give your tithe and offering right over the phone or 901-527-9255. Uh, you can do that alike. And even in the sanctuary, we have debit, debit card and credit card machines to my right and my left. You can sow and give in here, uh, or you can use your phones and or your devices and give electronically. Thank God for um, that kind of ingenuity where we're able to sow and give now. Amen. In so many ways, we can impact the kingdom of God. And I cannot overemphasize a thank you goes here for those of you that have been dedicated to this cause and helping us do what we do. If you're not in ministry, you don't know all the systems that are working in our behalf. And I want to thank, you know, we spent thousands of dollars the other Sunday just to say thank you to our volunteers. Uh, it wasn't a lot to each of them, but it was a lot altogether. It was thousands of dollars altogether because it was so many of them. But I want to thank you. So just take that little gift that we gave you and know it came from our hearts. Amen. And I know you weren't. And it probably meant more to you because you weren't looking for anything. And you've been doing what you've been doing without price. Amen. I want to thank you. Then I want to thank our staff members that have been faithfully working here at GCT. 
Thank you. That are here faithfully every day. I mean, they, they ain't working out the house. I'm talking about these people are working. They're at the job. They're on, they're on the spot doing what they must do because I'm a very active leader and I have to have people active and moving because anything can happen in a moment's time. And you got to be generally on the spot. I mean, calls come in, situations happen and arise. You have to have people around. And I want to thank them for even sometimes putting themselves at danger, if you would, because people come by dropping things off and they got to be here to get packages or to entertain others that may come off the street having needs. And I ask God, to, will you pray for our staff and ask God to continue to cover them in the name of Jesus and protect them as they're being kind to visitors and others and even as they're reaching out to you because whenever there's a devastation or problem they're calling your family members and so on amen is that jr i see back there amen jr your wife called me and told me about her mother and then she called me back to let me know the praise report because she was hysterical she thought mom was gone but god moved and made a way so we thank god for that amen he's still a prayer answering god I know we've had some situations uh, that um, did not have as well of an outcome, but so many others have. So there's still something to thank God for. Thank you for sowing and for giving. Let's prepare our gifts. Will you stand with us? Thanks. We're going to let you go. Amen. <clears throat> so next Sunday, y'all got to stop by the ATM before you come to church, right? <laughs> Amen. I know you're going to be a blessing. I thank you for it in advance because uh, I got to help some more people. Amen. Thank you for your love and your support. Just don't do it. Don't do it mean. Amen. You got to bring that cup in here nice. Amen. Hey, Pastor. Well, I ain't going to drink it if you slam it down now. I ain't going to drink it. Amen. But thank you for your love. Let's be a blessing. Uh, give a five cash app. That's the dollar sign. R-O-U-R-G-C-T Memphis T-N. Amen. Join in with us. Tuesday night Bible study as well. Join in with us this Tuesday night. And, and other settings and services and I know that God will add to us as we add to the work. Father, as we lift our seed or our devices that we're giving on, I pray that you'll minister to every need right now. Thank you again for these faithful ones that have gathered at home and other places and supporting the work even now. As they're giving now and even as they put in the chat, I believe God as they sow seed. Even in this sanctuary, God, bless them and make a way for them out of no way in the name of the Lord. I pray God for financial increase in Jesus' name, on every individual, under the sound of my voice, let your victory and blessings be theirs. In Jesus' name. Make a way, I pray. Hallelujah. And I thank you, God, for whoever that person is that needs that home to be sold, or they're trying to purchase something, God, or they need the price to come down, or they need something to go up. I need you to make a way for them. Whatever that negotiation is, let it be in their favor. Bless the saints everywhere we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout, I believe God.